Good evening. Welcome to the Health Insurance 101 webinar, where we are here to solve health insurance problems. Healthcare is a human right, and we're here tonight to make sure you have access to it. I'm Delegate Robin Lewis, and I'm really glad you're here. I'm happy to co-host this webinar with amazing experts from the Maryland Insurance Administration. I represent the 46th Legislative District, which is located in Baltimore City. I serve on the Health and Government Operations Committee in the Maryland General Assembly. So that means I am passionate about making sure every person in Maryland, regardless of age, color, race, gender, national origin, language spoken at home, immigration status, everybody, even people who like Nickelback, everybody gets the health care they need. Along with my District 46 colleagues, Senate President Bill Ferguson and Delegates Luke Klippinger and Mark Edelson, I really am honored to serve you. A couple months ago, I was talking with some wonderful leaders and experts at the Maryland Insurance Administration. They shared with me how hard they are working to do outreach and education to the people of Maryland, to let them know what the Maryland Insurance Administration can do to solve problems. We talked about it and we thought, what if we partner? And decided that it would be fun to co-host a webinar just like this, help people with problems to get the word out about the great work that the MIA or the Insurance Administration is doing for you. So I'm joined today by Lewis Butler, Director of Appeals and Grievances, and Patricia Dorn, Health Insurance Administrator, both of them at the MIA. They know everything there's to know about health insurance, and they will walk us through different ways to solve the most common challenges that people might face. Now, remember, this webinar, for anyone living in Maryland who has a health insurance plan and is having trouble getting access to care or getting their claims paid or any other problem with health insurance or their health insurance company. But specifically, the advice of this webinar will help anyone who has employer-sponsored health insurance. That is, you work for a company and they provide your health coverage. This webinar is also for people who have health, a health insurance plan offered under the Maryland Health Connection. If you're not sure, take out your health insurance card right now. Here's mine. I covered it over with Hello Kitty tape. You can't see the details, but you can see enough. You can see what you need to see. And that is in this upper corner, the logo of the Maryland Insurance Administration is visible. If you have your health insurance card and you can see that logo, it means that this webinar is for you and the MIA can help solve your problems with claims, denials, ap appeals, anything that you might face. So to close my opening remarks, I'll just remind you that as one of your state legislators who focuses on improving health care, I'm so pleased to partner with the good folks at the Maryland Insurance Administration. We're here to get the word out. We're here to help you. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to Mr. Butler, who'll walk us through what we can do. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Delegate Lewis, and thank you for everyone who will be attending uh, this particular webinar. We are super excited at the Maryland Insurance Administration to make you aware of resources available to Maryland consumers with health insurance issues. I am also, I will also be joined by Patricia Doran. Um, health insurance administrator. So at, towards the end of the presentation, we will sort of ask questions, sort of have a, a question and answer scenario that would be helpful. Um, we believe it would be helpful in some of the scenarios that we see on a regular basis in the complaints that the appeals and grievance receives and investigates. So with that, the agenda for today, the Maryland Insurance Administration, types of complaints, the MIA's life and health unit and appeals and grievance unit can review. When should a complaint be referred to the MIA? What the consumer needs to do to receive assistance from the MIA? What a consumer should expect as part of the complaint process? What is the Maryland Insurance Administration? The Maryland Insurance Administration is 
the state agency that regulates insurance in Maryland. The MIA licenses insurers and insurance producers, agents or brokers, examines the business practices of licensees to ensure compliance, monitors solvency of insurers, reviews, approves insurance policy forms, reviews insurance rates to ensure rates are not inadequate, excessive, or unfairly discriminatory, investigates consumer and provider complaints and allegations of fraud. Background, history. Specifically, the appeals and grievance process begins when a carrier renders an adverse decision, which includes a determination that a proposed or delivered healthcare service is not medically necessary, appropriate, or efficient. The member, the member's representative, or the treating provider acting on behalf of the member has the right to protest through the carrier's internal review process. I need to stop here for just a second, just to offer some clarification, because one of the challenges that we hear at the administration with regards to the carrier's internal appeals process is that members are reticent to take advantage of it because of, of they're fearful that if they were to file a complaint with the administration, that there would be some sort of retaliation. This webinar is designed to dispel that myth why? Because carriers are required by law to have this process in place, and they do. So based on individuals and providers taking advantage of it, they provide us with the opportunity to investigate those complaints. So I want to eliminate the fear that there is no retaliation if a member or a healthcare provider acting on behalf of the member files a complaint with this administration. Why? Because carrier carriers are prepared to receive those complaints. Background history. When a protest is filed with the carrier regarding an adverse decision, this is a grievance. If the carrier again determines that the proposed or delivered healthcare service is not medically necessary, the member, the member's representative, or the treating provider on behalf of the member may ask the Maryland Insurance Administration to review the carrier's grievance decision by filing a complaint how the law works. The appeals and grievance law, uh, how the law works, oh, there we are. The appeals and grievance law gives the MIA the authority to contract with three independent review organizations or IROs to review these medical necessity complaints. When the MIA sends a complaint to an IRO for review and the IRO assigns an expert reviewer for the complaint, Maryland law requires that the reviewer be an unbiased provider, the same specialty as the area or areas appropriate to the subject of review. The MIA's final decision on a complaint may be based on the IRO's, on, on the IRO's decision. If the complainant remains dissatisfied with the MIA's decision, he or she may make a request for a hearing to challenge the MIA's decision. It's important to note here, carriers do not have the right to an administrative hearing, but may file a petition for judicial review with the circuit court. Types of complaints the MIA's Life and Health Unit and Appeals and Grievance Unit can review. Generally, the MIA can review complaints involving health benefit plans delivered or issued in Maryland, including claim denials based on medical necessity, denials of all or part of a claim for other reasons, appeals of a carrier's denial or other possible violations of Maryland's insurance law. Types of complaints the MIA's Life and Health Unit and Appeals and Grievance Unit can review. Denials may include a claim denial, this is where your carrier or HMO has denied payment for a service or medication that was provided. An authorization denial. This is when a medication or treatment requires a referral or prior authorization from your provider, but this authorization has been denied by your insurance carrier or HMO. You are entitled to a written denial unless you or your provider 
agree to an alternative care plan. Appeals. If your health care provider tells you that a certain service or medication is needed, i.e. medically necessary, but your health insurance carrier or HMO denies your claim, this is a denial based on medical necessity and you have the right to appeal that decision. Generally, you must file a grievance with the carrier first before you can file a complaint with the MIA. However, in some cases, including, for example, when you have a compelling reason, you can file a complaint with the MIA first. Compelling reason could be that the patient is facing imminent bodily harm or challenges to their mental faculties or their mental health. So there, there are exceptions to that particular rule that allows a member to come directly to us based on a compelling reason. Appeals. In addition, you can appeal if you were approved for a lower level of care than you asked for, or you believe the end network or approved provider is too far away or the wait is too long, or you receive an approval for fewer visits than your provider thinks you need. Jurisdiction of the MIA's Life and Health Unit and Appeals and Grievance Unit. The MIA has jurisdiction over all insurers and HMOs authorized or licensed to conduct business in Maryland. Jurisdiction means that the MIA has the authority to regulate these entities and individuals, including investigating complaints. Jurisdiction of the MIA's Life and Health and Appeals and Grievance Unit, the MIA cannot address complaints or inquiries involving insurance contracts, which are not regulated by the state of Maryland. Generally, this includes the following, self-funded or self-insured employer plans, medical assistance, i.e. Medicaid, except for delayed payments, Medicare or Medicare HMOs, federal employee health benefit plans, uniform services, family health plans, and contracts issued and delivered to policyholders in another state. What the consumer needs to do to receive assistance from the MIA. Complaints can be filed online, mailed in, or faxed. Now I'll say that again. Complaints can be mailed, can be filed online, mailed in, or faxed. Forms can Forms to file a complaint are available on our website, www.insurance.maryland.gov backslash consumer backslash pages file a complaint.aspx. Mail or fax your complaint to Maryland Insurance Administration Attention Consumer Complaint Investigation Life and Health slash Appeals and Grievance, 200 St. Paul Place. Suite 2700, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202. Our fax number is 410-468-2260. That's for the Life and Health Unit. For the Appeals and Grievance Unit, that number is 410-468-2270. What the consumer needs to do to receive assistance from the MIA? We have a portal, which we're very happy and, and proud of online complaints, um, you can uh, HTTPS, um, enterprise.insurancemaryland.gov, um, consumer backslash consumer portal welcome page dot ASPX. If you have a disability and need to file a complaint by phone, you can call the MIA at 410 the patient signed consent is required for an appeals and grievance complaint. What a consumer should expect as part of the MIA's complaint process. You should receive an acknowledgement of the complaint within a few days. The acknowledgement letter will include the contact information for the MIA's investigator. It will also include the MIA file number. So any complaint that is filed with the administration as soon as we receive it, it is assigned to an investigator and that, that complaint will have the MIA's file number. It will also identify who the investigator is. It'll provide the investigator's telephone number and email address. Typically, that is something that you receive 
shortly after the complaint is received by the administration. You can call the investigator anytime if you have questions. Appeals and grievance complaint investigations are concluded, are required by statute. The statute gives us 45 days unless an extension of an additional 30 days is granted. And typically we would need additional time or an additional 30 day period if information that is necessary or important to the process has not been received. So typically um, that would probably be, we're in need maybe of additional medical documentation from, from the carrier or from the healthcare provider or additional information from the insurance company where we're waiting for that information because it's important for the commissioner to render a determination. So those are the, the sort of uh, parameters that we're looking at with regards to how long the, the complaint process in the appeals and grievance unit is. Given the fact that we have a portal, we can reach out to, as soon as we receive your complaint, we send, we contact the carrier via our portal. They, all the licensees in Maryland, they are part of the our portal. So they we respond, they, we correspond with each other that way. So that really expedites the time um, in terms of our ability to investigate complaints. So that's that's a positive for the consumers who actually file complaints with us. What the numbers show. In 2021, the Maryland Insurance Administration's Appeals and Grievance Unit either reversed or modified the carrier's grievance decision 71% of the time. And I'll say that again. In 2021, the Maryland Insurance Administration's Appeals and Grievance Unit either reversed or modified the carrier's grievance decision 71% of the time. Since the enactment of the Appeals and Grievance Law, the Maryland Insurance Administration's Appeals and Grievance Unit has recovered over $12 million for complainants. This is important to know because what we offer is free. My staff, I'm experts. So they, we, we do this all the time on a regular basis. We've seen all sorts of complaints. And the one thing about the appeals and grievance unit is that we impact individuals actually where they are. The vast majority of people that come to, to our unit, they are, they are awaiting care. There may be some retrospective matters, but for the most part, they're in need of care. So to the extent that we can impact them in a positive way, that's what we that's what we attempt to do. There may be instances where, let's say, for example, the member doesn't get the complainant doesn't receive an outcome that's favorable to them. Well, the one positive about our process is that it's thorough. So we re we've received surveys from individual complainants who, even obviously, sometimes the thinking would be if the matter was reversed in the in the complainant's favor. Yeah, we would receive a favorable survey, but we've also received favorable surveys in instances where the carrier's decision was upheld or affirmed. And that's largely because the process is thorough. So individuals understand that this, this the appeals and grievance unit is available. They contacted me, they kept me apprised of the various steps in the complaint process. So it wasn't a situation, they, they, they answered my calls when I, when I reached out, they called me back. All of those kinds of things are very important. And it provides us with a, an advantage because again, the subject matter experts that we have on staff here, they are always paying attention to the details. They know what questions to ask. And they also allow com complainants to articulate their concerns because by the time a caller gets to us, They've sort of gone through the process and they're somewhat frustrated. And sometimes they just want to hear a voice. They just want to hear, some, they just want somebody to listen to their concerns. And to, the, to a large extent, that's what we do. Obviously, we're listening. We're listening to information gathered. In those, in those sort of laments that we often hear from consumers, it provides us with the details that we need in terms of what questions we need to ask. Of the, of, of the complainant or of the carrier. So the role that we play here, although we're regulators, we also listen and we listen intently to make certain that we don't miss anything. 
so that we can figure out how to best assist this particular consumer of insurance, the complainant. How the MIA is improving consumer outreach. Commissioner Bahrain is very intentional in terms of increasing the administration's digital footprint by creation of a 24 seven hotline marketing campaign, robust social media campaign, promoting the 24 seven hotline. What that means is my unit, the appeals and grievance unit, we are on call. There's always a representative available to receive after hours and weekend medical emergency calls. So we actually, when, okay, I'm, I'm not on call right now, but we have someone who is on call. So if someone, if a consumer were to contact, reach out to the administration, they would actually speak to a live voice that can walk them through the process of next steps. Consumer newsletters, various marketing materials, including first aid kits, kits, magnets, flyers, podcasts, slash video production to promote 24-7 hotline, YouTube channels, social media web websites, consumer education and outreach is what we're doing right now. Um, Joy Hatchett's unit um, participates. They You'll find them at various community events, fairs, libraries, motor, the MBA, farmers markets. In other words, the, we're, the administration is intentional in terms of putting, being visited in the community, Throughout the, throughout the state of Maryland to make certain that, that consumers are aware of the rights that they have with their insurance coverage. Because in, 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 unfortunately, this is an area, or maybe fortunately, it's an opportunity for improvement. So I would look at it that way. Um, also partnering with state senators and delegates office to promote uh, the 24 seven campaign. With this, um, I would ask Patty, um, Dorm to join me at this point because we have some sample questions of what we see on a regular basis, some of the scenarios that we sort of see, um, and we would like to sort of share that with you all at this point. So, Patty. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, my name is Patty Dorn, and I'm the Health Insurance Administrator with the Maryland Insurance Administration. Lewis and I are going to go through a series of example questions about Abigail. These are good at representing some of the types of questions that Lewis receives in the appeals and grievance unit. So I'm going to ask him the question, and then he's going to answer. So starting with question one. Jessica and Michael are worried about their daughter, Abigail, who is 15 years old. They aren't sure what the problem is, but it seems to be beyond teenage general moodiness. Abigail's grades are falling and she's gotten into a physical fight with her younger brother and her parents think she may be drinking. Her school social worker suggested an evaluation by a psychiatrist. Abigail's parents can't afford to go out of network to get this treatment. How should they start the process to have Abigail evaluated and make sure that this will be covered? Patty, a good place to start is with Abigail's primary care provider for recommendations of behavioral health care providers. Typically, a referral is not needed anymore, but it can't hurt to start there. Jessica and Michael can also start looking for psychiatrists through the Carriers Online Directory. They should check that they are searching using the right plan shown on their insurance card because different plans may have different networks and there are probably there will probably be multiple options on the carrier's website. Thanks, Lewis. Next slide, please. So they tried the online directory, but they found that there were mistakes in the directory itself, and it was very frustrating. What should they do at this point? There are laws requiring carriers to keep their directories up to date. And so if there is incorrect information in the provider's directory, it is helpful to you to report the errors to the health plan. Maryland law requires health plans to list a way to report the incorrect information that is on their website and requires carriers to investigate and update the information. If they don't, then you can file a complaint with the MIA. Of course, in the short term, Jessica or Michael can also call the health plan for help and use the number on the back of their ID cards. There may be a separate number for behavioral health services and some plans will provide additional help 
with finding a behavioral health provider if you ask. Example three, Jessica and Michael were able to get Abigail evaluated by a psychiatrist and she was able to start making progress with an in-network therapist. However, before her therapy sessions were over, the therapist indicated that they were no longer accepting the parents' insurance, and Jessica and Michael have been unable to find another in-network therapist with the same level of expertise to treat Abigail. What should they do at this point? Patty, they can request a referral to keep seeing the same therapist. Maryland law requires health plans to have a process to request a referral to an out-of-network provider if you need one and they don't have an in-network provider with the expertise. To find those procedures, you can look in your policy or your certificate of coverage, or you can look in your health plan's online provider directory because health plans are required to put that information with their provider directory. The health plan is also required to provide the procedures upon request so you can call and request them. If a, if a referral is given, the cost sharing will be the same as for an in-network provider. However, the provider may balance bill. Balance billing means the provider can bill for the difference between the health plan's allowed amount and the provider's usual charges. The health plan may enter into a single case agreement with the provider to prevent the balance billing. However, the agreement may be limited to certain services and claims may have to be sent to a different address than the normal PO box than the carriers normally use. Question number four. What if the request was denied because the health plan says that there are providers in network? Jessica and Michael don't think that the particular in-network providers have the necessary level of expertise or that it's unreasonable for them to wait because there's going to be a delay before they can actually get in to an appointment. They don't want to disrupt Abigail's treatment since she's been doing well, and they don't want to see any deterioration in the progress that she's been making. So, Lewis, what would you recommend to the parents at this juncture? Patty, my recommendation to Jessica and Michael is they have a right to challenge or appeal the health plan's decision that its in-network providers are adequate. The health plan's decision to not allow Abigail, Abigail to receive treatment from an out-of-network provider is considered an adverse decision. A determination that a proposed or delivered health care service is not medically necessary, appropriate, or efficient. Jessica and Michael have a right to protest this decision through the health plan's internal review process. When the health plan renders an adverse decision, they are required to provide the member with a detailed explanation in writing in the form of a letter, notice of adverse decision, or an explanation of benefits, i.e. EOB. Either document will instruct them on how to initiate the health plan's internal review process. If the health plan Again, determines that its in-network provider is adequate, Jessica and Michael may ask the Maryland Insurance Administration to review the health plan's grievance decision, the health plan's decision to uphold its adverse decision by filing a complaint. The MIA has the authority to contract with independent review organizations to review medical necessity complaints. Based on the IRO's medical opinion, the MIA reaches a decision either to uphold, modify, or reverse the health plan's decision. Question five, the situation has gotten worse, unfortunately. Abigail has threatened to kill her brother and herself, and it's clear that she needs emergency treatment. What can be done to make sure that she's able to obtain the treatment that she needs at this point? Patty, in the case of mental health, emotional health disorder, or substance use disorder emergencies, if a patient is in imminent danger to self or others, and the determination is made by the patient's physician or psychologist and a member of the medical staff of the facility who has admitting privileges, then 
An insurance company cannot deny the first 24 hours of admission based on medical necessity. It's important that Abigail or her parents notify the insurance company as soon as possible. For emergency and patient in admission for treatment of mental illness, emotional health disorder, or substance use disorder, the insurance company must make a decision on whether to pre-authorize the treatment within two hours of receiving the requested documents. If the insurance company denies the request for an admission, call the Maryland Insurance Administration at 1-800-492-6116. The MIA is available 24 hours a day for complaints and emergency when care has not yet been rendered. In an emergency, the MIA will make a decision within 24 hours. If the MIA does not regulate your health plan, your complaint will be sent to the agency that does regulate the plan. Thanks, Wes. The parents have found, and it's been recommended, that Abigail go to a mental health facility that's located in Arizona that has a history of success in dealing with these particular issues. What should the parents do if they would like to send her to this particular facility? Patty, it's important to note inpatient care usually requires prior authorization. To start the process, obtaining prior authorization for an out-of-network provider, call the number on the back of the patient's health insurance ID card first. The insurance company will ask what health care services you would like to receive and, when appropriate, what facility you would like to use. The insurance company will tell you what documents it needs in order to decide if it will pre-authorize the health care service. Maryland requires that insurance companies accept a provider's uniform treatment plan form if the health plan is subject to Maryland law. A uniform treatment plan form is a document used by providers to record the information needed by the insurance company to decide whether it will pre-authorize the requested service and or facility. If these services are authorized under out-of-network benefits, there may be a higher cost sharing and availability. Jessica and Michael can appeal the amount paid if it seems unreasonably low and can file a complaint with the MIA if the carrier upholds its appeal or denial. Lastly, the MIA can review whether the payment is based on their policy or certificate of coverage or violates Maryland law. Um, the last example question, Abigail has been authorized to receive treatment and she goes to the facility and her treating psychologist, Dr. Gomez, says she needs two visits every week for the next 12 weeks. The plan says she can have two for only four weeks. Is there anything the family can do at this point? First, Patty, if Dr. Gomez agreed to accept the authorization of for four weeks, it may not be a denial. So he's like agreeing to what the carrier is offering. However, if Dr. Gomez did not agree, then we're talking about an adverse decision. You ask for one thing, the carrier gives you something else, or you ask for one thing and they don't give you anything. Dr. Gomez can file a grievance on behalf of Abigail and her parents. Many providers get a written consent form as part of the paperwork for a new patient. That means whenever you go to the doctors, you're signing like a bunch of paperwork. Um, typically, um, if doctors can get the patient signed consent, it will authorize them to file a complaint with our office. That is something that we actually encourage because in the appeals and grievance unit, we require the patient signed consent. That's a critical part or key to what allows us to do what we do on our end. So it's important if the doctors have that. Some of the Frequent filers that file with us, um, healthcare providers that file with us, they actually use our, cons our um, consent form. So when they file their complaints with us, we're ready to rock and roll. We can, we can, and we, that we're not waiting for the patient signed consent. We have it, and we're in good shape, and we can be, initiate the complaint process. So that allows us to do what we need to do on our end in terms of conducting the investigation. But also, in the event that the the case gets reversed in the in the patient's favor. It allows them to receive the care that much sooner without waiting. So the signed consent is a critical part piece to what we do. 
Providers often uh, try to call for a peer-to-peer -peer discussion and become frustrated at the time it takes. Dr. Gomez can mail, email, or fax a written grievance, and the health plan will have to respond in writing. This may save time in the long run and will satisfy the legal requirement to exhaust the, the internal appeals process. If the health plan still says that two visits a week for 12 weeks is not medically necessary, then Dr. Gomez or Abigail's pa parents may file a complaint with the Maryland Insurance Administration. The MIA can send the complaint to an independent review organization to get an opinion on whether the care is medically necessary. We're at the end of our presentation. Uh, Delegate Lewis, are there any questions from anyone? We will be more than happy to try to entertain or respond to them best of our ability. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Butler, Ms. Dorn, for your expertise, your thorough and patient explanation, description of all the different things that might go wrong uh, and all of the different ways that the people in Maryland can rely on the Maryland Insurance Administration to get help, to get answers, to get solutions. Thank you both very much. Uh, since we are recording this uh, webinar and we'll be sharing it with the public afterwards, both MIA um, on their own website as well as myself through my office, folks can watch and they may very well come up with questions that we'll have to help answer. I, awesome. I, I promise to forward any questions that my office might receive to you. So with that, I think we'll wind up. I'd like to thank the Maryland Administ uh, Insurance Administration once more for their amazing work. I want to uh, salute the MIA for taking the extra step of conducting active outreach to the people of Maryland through their 24 seven campaign. I'd like to underscore as well that whenever any person in Maryland has trouble getting what they need from us from uh, from really for any reason, a problem you can't solve, a question you can't answer. Remember that there are a number of elected officials that work for you. I'm one of them and you can always reach out to your elected official. You should know that when we don't know the answer, we go to the Maryland Administ uh, Insurance Administration or other state agencies, depending on the problem. We also depend on the MIA to help us help you. So I'm really pleased to call myself a partner with your agency to salute and lift up the great work you're doing and to continue to share uh, share the news, uh, share the word that help is here. My dad had a lot of great sayings. And one of his favorites was that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you're a person in Maryland and you're having a problem, I urge you to squeak until you get the help you need. MIA is a great agency and a great place to start. With that, thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.